Okay, so we started Parshas Toldos, and we started right uh, uh, with Yitzhak and Rivka. Now let's go. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, at the at the pause, like Something very strange here, right off the bat. Eila told us Yitzhak ben Avram Avram Alidas Yitzhak. Yesterday we spoke about the idea of the connection of generations. Yitzhak ben he Yitzhak ben Arboim Shana bekachto is Rivka bas besul Arami mipada Aram achos Lovan Arami lola Ije. He takes Rivka, the sister of Lovan, as a wife. Now, Pasuk Chaf Aleph, fourth line, fourth line from the top. This is where, 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 the, where the difficulties begin. Vayetar Yitzhak la Hashem le nochach ishto ki akorahi. Yitzhak davened to Hashem, opposite his wife, because she was barren. Vaye oser lo Hashem, Hashem responded to him. Vatar rifka ishto, she becomes pregnant. Now, first of all, the word vayetar comes from the Hebrew word atar. Atar is a spade. And the Medrash says, why is the prayer of the righteous compared to a spade? Why is the prayer of the righteous compared to a spade? So the Gemara says, so the Medrash says, the same way, it might even be a Gemara, I think it's the Gemara that says it, the same way a spade takes and it turns something over from side to side, the prayer of a tzaddik, thank you very much, can turn Midas Hadin to Midas Arachamim. The prayer of a tzaddik turns God's strict judgment in the Israel. That's how powerful, that's how powerful uh, uh, a tefillah is. Okay? Now, Yitzhak Davin says wife. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you see anything a bit peculiar in the structure of the apostle? Yitzhak Davin to Hashem, opposite his wife, because she was barren, and Hashem responded to him, and she became pregnant. Anything you find particularly strange in the, in the structure of the apostle? Opposite his wife. Opposite his wife means they stood in opposite corners. They stood in corners, I mean, alongside his wife, but not, you know, they, they, stood, they stood together opposite each other, and, and you know, they, they prayed simultaneously. What do you say, Alex? Uh, well, in English, I can't really read the Hebrew, it says, Hashem allowed himself. It's like, is it talking about God allowed God? Uh, Hashem allowed himself to be entreated. Yeah, yeah, but yes, Hashem, that's only because... <laughs> It's only because they don't have a great English translation for the verb form of of prayerified, okay. right? Hashem was prayerified, right? That's why Yisrael Hashem. Hashem responded to his prayer. That's how I would have translated Hashem. By Yisrael Hashem, Hashem responded to his prayer. But it's a very awkward and, per, to, to a certain extent, non-existent form of the translation that we would want if we were translating in, 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 into the English. So that doesn't work. So what? Uh, so that's why the article translates the way it is. So let me ask you a question. What What is the subject of the story here? Rebecca was barren. Yes, very good, Gil. Rebecca was barren. So if you were writing this pasuk, what would you? How would you have written it? If you're submitting an essay. Rebecca was barren, so Isaac prayed for. Her. Excellent, excellent, perfect, perfect. The subject is the offspring. The subject is the offspring, which is a result of her being pregnant after she was barren. There happens to be one side point here that the way she got the Austrians is just like prayed. You understand? <laughs> you, you, you understand? <laughs> so the, the, the answer is we've got a completely uh, 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 um, misunderstood take on prayer. You ask your average guy in the street, what's prayer for? What would most people say? What's Getting prayer stuff. for? What? Getting stuff. To get stuff. You need something, you pray. You don't, you got it, you don't pray. You know, I need a Mercedes, I pray. Got the Mercedes, find something else I need. Right? I need my neighbor not to have a Mercedes. Right? Okay, good. <laughs> so, so I'll pray for that. You understand? You understand the, the, the standard take on people, I need something, I pray. I don't need something, I don't pray. What am I going to waste? I'm not going to waste my time davening. Right? The answer is that we're making a mistake here. That's not the purpose of tefillah. It's not the purpose of tefillah. The purpose of tefillah, and pay attention because it's a massive subject. The purpose of prayer is to draw close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the purpose of prayer. And there are different means that a Kodesh Rochel could resort to in order to draw us closer. Now, you've heard the statement that God desires the prayer of the righteous. HaKadosh Baruch Hu mis'ava l'tfilah shem sol tzadikim. Did you ever hear that idea? The Gemara says, why was it, you find an interesting coincidence, Avram and Sarah didn't have children. Yitzchak and Rivka didn't have children. Yaakov's favorite white Rochel didn't have children. Leah had children right away. But... Even she was barren. She was originally not going to have children. You know why she had children right away? Because the rumor monger said, well, Lovon has two daughters, and Yitzhak has two sons. Lovon's older daughter, Leah, will marry Esau. 
Lovin's younger daughter, Rachel, were Mary Yaakov. Well, when Rulea heard the rumors, and everybody was talking about how she's destined to marry Esav, it says in the Medrash, she cried. That's why her eyes are described as being soft. They were, they were softened through constant tears. Now, what does it mean she cried? I mean, some little Sally saucer, you know, you know, just sitting in the corner crying, you know, crying for no reason. It means she cried her eyes out in prayer. Oh, you've already achieved whatever is meant to be achieved through prayer. You've achieved it already. You've done your, your tefillah, so you could have children right away. Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, they were all barren because they have to be brought to prayer. And their husbands have to be brought to prayer for them. Now, what does that mean? So the example I always like to use is the Navy SEALs. Right? The Navy SEALs. Yeah, everybody's heard about them now because they killed, what's his name, with the beard, with the tichel and the beard, uh, what's his name, uh, Bin Laden. Bin Laden. I guess everybody heard about the Navy SEALs. I had read, about, I was in, I had read up on the Navy SEALs already years ago. It was, it was, a, it was a potential career choice. And uh, uh, the... Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> that and a helicopter rescue pilot. Yeah, yeah, those were my career choices. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, the uh, what do you call it? They had a bungee jumping instructor. Yeah. So uh, um, um, the uh, I have absolutely no qualities necessary to be a Navy SEAL. There's not one quality that I have to be a Navy SEAL. I'm a coward. Uh, I do not like inconveniences. I, uh, I'm afraid of everything. You know, I, I would just not, not have made it. So um, the Navy SEAL starts like this. I'm going to give you an example. An example is not far from the actual training. If anything, it's under-exaggerated. Under, uh, Let's say they start out with a group of 500, a unit of 500 guys who already have proven themselves as crack Marines, right? So you're talking about the biggest, the strongest, the most rugged of all. They start out with a group of 500 guys, and by the way, they will sometimes start and go into training and not one of the 500 qualifies. They will have units that, they're, that, they're, that not one person passes that qualifies to be a Navy SEAL. All right? So these start out with 500 guys. The first week is sleep deprivation week. You get to sleep, you know, 20 minutes a night for an entire week. By the third or fourth day, 500 guys, 200 guys are going out of their minds, right? They drop out of the program. By the third or fourth week, they, they drop out of the program. They take them put them into a room, a nice meal, a bed, go to sleep, you're out of the program. They go to the second week, 300 guys go to what's called ice water submersion. On and off submersion ice water for 12 hours a day. By the middle of the week, another 200 guys, no way, you know, we're out of this. They drop out of the program, put them in a warm room, a bed, a meal, you're out of the program. The third 100 guys, last 100 guys, they go off to the last week, which is being dangled upside down by one foot for about nine hours a day on and off. By the middle of the week, another 70 guys drop out, 30 guys finish the program, they're the Navy, Navy SEALs, okay? Now, imagine an outsider, somebody from the outside watching what just took place. None of this makes sense. They failed the first week, so they got a bed and food, and they went out to ice water. They failed, they got a bed and wood, they get to be dangled upside down, doesn't make any sense. Make it. The answer is, whoa, it's like you took your focus off the goal, depends what the goal is. You want to become a Navy SEAL? It's going to cost you, to get that honor, you're going to have to invest. It's going to cost you to get that honor. Same thing for professions of life. You want to be a doctor, you're going to have to work like crazy. I have a friend who's a doctor. I used to ask him what, what his daily schedule was he, when he was in medical school. He told me he got up at 6.30 in the morning, started studying, studied straight till 10.30 at night, took off 20 minutes to play ping pong, to let out his aggressions, and then back to the books. Day after day after day. But he's a doctor now. He's out earning the guys who are accountants. You want to be an accountant, you go to school for four years. You, know, you want to be, a, you want to be a, a, a phys ed major, like I was, you know, so you go to school for even less. You, know, you want to be a rabbi, no school at all. You know, you know, all right? So it depends, it depends what you want to do. It depends what you want to do, what you want to earn. But there are often in times where to get the privilege, how do you, you think they let anybody who wants to go be a brain surgeon? You got to pass six years of medical school, train uh, until you finally become a brain surgeon. You know, they, you know what that involves? So the rule is that in life, to earn a certain privilege, you're going to have to, you're going to go through, a, or, or, you failed, you're out. You know, they always, the guys go to football training camp. 
in a football training camp, they're trying to make a football team. You're jumping through tires and you're pushing, what do you call it? And you're taking hits and you're doing everything in football. You're not on the team. We're cutting you right now. Once you cut you, you go off, go have a meal, go do whatever you want. Right. And these guys are going to go get punished by a 300-foot line, lineman now. You know, go go see how many hits you could take from both linemen at the same time. Right. Well, he's going off to a restaurant to eat falafel. I understand. <laughs> what you, he's getting a reward. They're being punished. No, no, they're still trying to achieve a goal. When it comes to prayer, the goal of prayer is to create a bond with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the goal of prayer. Prayer is not to get stuff. It works to get stuff. It works. But that's not the purpose of prayer. The purpose of tefillah is to create a bond and achieve a closeness with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's the purpose of prayer. So what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu do? HaKadosh Baruch Hu picks a candidate. He says, hey, Avram Avino, you've made yourself into a great person. You've earned the privilege. That means you passed the original course. You have made the cutoff. You have made the. You are one of the chosen few who has now made it, and you're going into Navy SEALs training because you made it. It's going to be difficult training, but you've made it. You passed. The other guys failed. They're out of here. Avram Avinu, you've made yourself into such a great person. I'm going to give you an opportunity to draw even closer to me. God is the source of all good. The greatest connection, the closer more you are connected to God, the greater, the greater the, 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 the privilege, the greater the pleasure. I'm gonna, you know how you're going to do it? I'm going to withhold something that you want very much that's going to force a level of prayer out of you, which I'm not going to get out of you any other way. And therefore, I'm going to draw you close with that prayer. That's what a coach brother does. That's what it means God desires the prayers of the righteous. So he withholds specifically the thing they want most because they've earned the privilege of now coming closer. It's painful, it's grueling, it's an ordeal, but you've earned it, okay? Now, you have to be careful here because um, things could be withheld for different reasons. Things could be withheld because uh, God wants to draw you closer. Sometimes he withholds it because it's a punishment for you. Sometimes he may withhold something because it's just that good for you. You know, you don't, you're, you're, you'll, you'll hurt yourself if I give this to you, and so on and so forth. But the idea, that's one of the, you know, there's a, there's a story, a guy... Rabbi Hanania Cholik is the head of the uh, Ezer Mitzion. Ezer Mitzion is a medical relief organization in Israel. Rabbi Hanania Cholik is the head of Ezer Mitzion. So he was at the Kotel with a very wealthy man. The guy is courting this guy because he needs a donation for, his, for his, uh, his medical organization. One of the biggest medical organizations in Israel. So they're standing there at the Kotel and he sees a Jew is standing there crying his eyes out. He was crying his eyes out. So Rav Cholik says to this wealthy man, look, if this guy, a Jew's crying, the guy, guy's, the guy's weeping like crazy, it can only be one of two things, right? Either there's a medical problem in the family, in which case I'll take responsibility, I'll help the guy out, I'll ask the guy, can I help you, you know, whatever I can put my resources at his disposal. If it's a financial thing, which is a second alternative, you do it. That wealthy people like challenges, you know. It's boring to just give money away. Say, you know, okay, I like that. You know, it's intriguing. So Cholik goes over and says, my dear sir, my name is Hanania Cholik. If you or any of your family members are, are ill, you know, I'll have medical doctors, referral services, anything we can help you with, we will. He says, no, Baruch Hashem, we're all basically healthy, you know, one or two ingrown toenails here, you know, Jewish stuff. But, uh, but, uh, but, but every, other than that, other than that, we're basically okay. For some reason, you know, Italians don't get ingrown toenails. You never hear about it. You know, it's, it's a very Jewish thing. It's much more percentage in B'nai Brock than it is in the South Bronx. You know, it, it, I don't know for, what, for whatever reason. Okay, so he says, no, we're all okay. So Cholak goes to the wealthy man and says, okay, you're up. Guy walks over and puts his arm around his shoulder. He says, hi, just name the price. I'll fill it in. It's a blank check, whatever you need. The guy says, no, thank you very much. We're actually, we're okay. I mean, we don't have a lot, but we're, we're okay. So Cholik says, so why are you crying? He says, I'll tell you, I have 12 children. Every time I have to make worry off one of my children, the shidduchim and in-laws and money and in-laws and the band and in-laws, you know, and everything that goes around with the shidduch. So it's a difficult process. So every time I've needed to marry off one of my children, I've come to the Kotel and I've davened. My coach brothers responded, we married them off. Last night, we married off our 12th and final child. I just came down here to say thank you. He's going to say thank you to Coach Rock. Right? Now, what that means is that if you pour out your heart in sincere thanks to Coach Rock, so then you could sometimes achieve what you would have achieved had he withheld something and then nothing needs to be withheld. You understand the benefit? 
You could actually go and dive and thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for giving me health. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for giving me parents. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for enlightening me to see the truth to come to our Sameach. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for giving me Parnassah. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for not making me a White Sox fan. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that I'm not from Cleveland. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, for all the various things in life, all the brachas in life that a person can have, we thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, if you really do that, in the, since the whole purpose of tefillah is to get close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there's no need to withhold anything from you. Because the point of withholding sometimes is to draw you closer. So a person has to pour his heart, say, pour his heart out sincerely in thanks and gratitude to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You can achieve a tremendous amount that way. You can do a tremendous amount that way. With all of our gripes and all of our problems and all of our complaints in life, but if you dive in and you say, thank you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that's a very powerful tefillah. That's a very potent tefillah. So the Torah says, Vayeta Yitzhak la Hashem Yitzhak davens opposite his wife. You know why he davened? You know, sorry, why did Yitzhak, the subject of the story is not the children. The subject of the story is davening. And why did he daven? Ki akarahi. Side point, because she was barren. Had it not for that, Vayeta Yitzhak would have davened, because he had a heart condition. Yitzhak would have davened, because he was financially not well. The whole point of the story is the davening. Davening is the subject, not a, 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 a detail. Everything else is a detail. That's what a person has to get used to when it comes to tefillah. Tefillah is, the, is not the means. Tefillah is the ends. The means is what a person needs. The means is what a, it's a means to get us to daven, not the opposite. The world sees it the opposite direction. Okay? But sometimes, like Kodesh Baruch Hu, a person is missing something. It could be something big or something little. And of course, Baruch Hu davens. We get a person, that's a way of getting you to daven. Without that, why would we ever dive it? So could we dive it now like, and say, okay, God, when we get married, is that we should have healthy children? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now the other words, should, the person should dive in already, even if you're not looking to get married, you should be diving to get married. You should dive in to have a good wife. Even now. Even now, you should dive in for a good wife. And, and even after you're married, you should dive in she remains a good wife. And after you're married, and, 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 and you should be a good husband. All, always diving for everything. The only thing you can't dive for is impossible. You can't dive for something impossible. I should have a good mother-in-law. That you can't dive. <laughs> Anything that would require a miracle, you can't dive for, right? But but the, but the, you dive for everything. You dive for every life situation. Here we here we make a hundred brachas a day. You make a hundred brachas a day. Now I once made a I did a little exercise. You know, you enjoy this show. I did. I did a very interesting exercise. What what does Baruch Ata Hashem mean? What does Baruch Ata Hashem mean? Blessed are you, Hashem. You mean we're giving Hashem a blessing? It's a source of blessing. The, 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 the problem is that the, sitter, the Sidurim generally translate in some pathetic manner, like, blessed art thou, O Lord. You know, you know we don't need to bless a Kodesh Baruch. We don't need our blessing created us, right? We are making a declaration. Baruch to Hashem is like saying, Atah Kadosh. We say, that, what do you say, Atah Kadosh? What, is it, what, are you, what are you saying? You are holy. What happens when you make a declaration you are holy? Well, who does that make? Who does that benefit? Yourself. Of course. Because we have an idea of who it is that I'm speaking to. Atok Kadosh, Hashem is holy. Mechai Amazing, you bring the deadline. Anything declaration I make a Kodesh puts him in perspective for me so that I can serve him better. Baruch Ato Hashem is so fundamental. We are making you, in other words, the word blessed he has another form which also doesn't agree. Blessed means you are inherently blessed. You are the source of blessing. You are blessed. We get it from you. That's what we're really saying, as opposed to, I give you a bracha, because I'm such a tzaddik. Right? That's, that's not what we're doing. Blessed art thou. He doesn't need our bracha. We're making a declaration that he is the source of all blessing. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. Just imagine, you say to your mother, ten times a day, when you're home, you say, she serves you a good meal. Mom, you are the source of my blessing in life. Thank you for that supper. Whew, whew, right? <laughs> right? Then you say to her, Mom, you are the source of my blessing. Thanks for folding the towels. Thanks for putting the socks in my... Okay? Now, if you do it sincerely, no one will ever be tired of it. If you do it over and over again, people just, just stop already. That's the idea of a bracha levatola. Can you imagine a man saying to his wife, Mr. Fogel, and again, you and I... It's science fiction. We both know that. A man says to his wife, you are the source of my joy in life. Thank you for the delicious supper. You are the source of the joy in my life. Thank you for folding up and putting away my clothing. You are the source of the joy in my life. Thank you for being so quiet tonight. 
You are the source. <laughs> you are you are the source of the joy in my life. Thank you for not taking the credit card. You are the source of joy in my life. Now, by the time that happens, you'll have a different relationship with her. Because you keep reminding yourself every month, she's the source of your joy. So if you say that about fruit, now I'm picture of bracha. You are the source of all blessing, God. Thank you for giving me this apple. Well, that, that, that helps you with the relationship with God. You are the source of all blessing. Thank you, Hashem, for helping me to relieve myself normally. Make that bracha dozen a few times a day. You are the source of all blessing, Hashem, who has done this, that, or the other. So you said it now. How many brachas, listen to this, this is remarkable, this is absolutely mind-boggling. How many brachas do you make a day? Does, does the Jew have to make a day? A hundred. Minimum of a hundred brachas a day. Let's say we do. And let's say we've been doing it since our bar mitzvah. So a hundred brachas a day comes out to 700 brachas a week. 2,800 brachas a month. We'll call it 3,000 and multiply it by 10 instead of going into the 12s. 3,000 brachas a month is 30,000 brachas a year. Remember, we're undercounting, but let's keep call it that. 30,000 brachas a year. In 10 years, 300,000 brachas. In 30 years, you've made a million brachas. In 30 years. A guy who started his bar mitzvah, by the age of, say, in 60 years, by the time he's 75, he's made two to two and a half million brachas in his lifetime. Now imagine after 120 years, this guy comes up to heaven. The heavenly court says to him, uh, okay, Yankel, did you, uh, did you daven in your life? Oh, I daven. Oh, did I daven? Man, I always daven. Oh, yeah? Did you make brachas? Oh, brachas. I mean, brachas is my middle name. That and flossing, my favorite thing, you know. Yeah, the, yeah. oh, did I make brachas? Yeah? How many? I don't know. I'd say about two and a half, three million. No, kid, that's great. What does bracha to Hashem mean? Blessed art thou, O Lord. Why were you blessing me? I created you. Oh, I never thought of that. Huh, interesting. You mean you did something three million times in the course of life that you never thought about it? You said it three million times, you never thought about it? Baruch to Hashem, you are the source of all blessing. If you say that a hundred times a day, by the end of the day, you have a different relationship with the Kodesh Baruch You say it 700 times a week, you have a different relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Who's the benefit? We're the benefit. Not him. Benefits for us. Why? Same thing with davening three times a day. Why do you daven three times a day? And I told you, davening never comes at a good time. In the morning, I'm tired. At night, I'm hungry. And at mincha, I'm tired and hungry. Right? <laughs> never comes at a good time. Every time, the time, right in the middle of the day, I get up in the morning, I got things to do. I got to check my emails, and I got, first thing is, check in with our Kodesh Baruch Hu. He's sending you some emails also, right? At night, before I go to sleep, yeah, oh boy, am I tired, right? Just say goodbye for the evening. In the middle of a work day, you're in the middle, you're on Wall Street, you're in Manhattan, you're in the middle of work day. There's a minion in the office. Every, Jew, every from office has a minion. There's actually a non-Jewish guy once saw, saw one of these from guys, he says, I know why you from guys are so good, why you Jews are so good at, at business. He says, yeah, why? He says, I see you every day, about 10, 15 of you stand there over in the corner for a few minutes thinking about business over there. And I, <laughs> he doesn't know how right he is. <laughs> somebody, wanted, somebody, wanted, once wanted to say, somebody once said, if you ever want to try to remember who owes you money, Davin Shmona Esra, you'll remember. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I never have to travel anywhere in the world. I've been there. You know, I've been everywhere around. I've been everywhere in the world. Oh, you know, I daven three times a day. <laughs> right. So you see, if you do it properly, in the middle of the day, you're reminding yourself, you're reminding yourself, hey, you know, I got to make contact over here. You know, do it three times a day. I once went, my, my, my wife's from Columbus, Ohio. Told you it's not my fault, but she is. So, so I went to I, what, they, they they have a Schottenstein's department store there. You know the the, the, the Talmud Bavli Schottenstein's are they're they're they that's their that's their home turf is Columbus, Ohio. So I walked in. I had to go speak to my brother-in-law. He works as an accountant in one of Schottenstein's department stores. So I go in and there's a young lady there, obviously not Jewish, and a lot of, not a lot whole lot of Jews in Columbus from Jews certainly. And I walk over to her. I say, "Excuse me, do you know where Mr. Cohen is?" And she looks, she goes, he's in Minyan. I said, well, where? And she could have said what, you know, imagine, imagine Elvis, somebody who believes in Elvis Presley, Elvis Presley is still alive, telling you, well, he's in Minyan. I said, uh, he's where? She goes, Minyan. I said, where, where is this here, Minyan? <laughs> you know, because she couldn't have been told me what I saw. 
She goes, well, walk to the second office in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the back of the area, second office on the right. Okay, I walk back there. Sure enough, 10 guys from all over the stores. They're there, they're davening mincha. I think one was intermarried, one was secular, one was... That. No, but they're davening them in the middle of the day. To this day, she has no idea what Minyan is. I think she thinks Minyan is a small town in the suburbs of Columbus. You know, he's, he's in Minyan. She has no idea what Minyan, what Minyan is. The idea, no matter what you're doing, you stop and you make contact. That's the idea of tefillah. That's why it says Vayat there first. Okay? That's the idea. That's the idea. Right. Okay, now I want to show you a Rashi over here. In, Pasuk, uh, in the same Pasuk, towards the end of the Pasuk, it says, Vayei Oser lo Hashem. Hashem responded to him, Vatahar Rivka Ishta. You see that in Pasuk Hopez. So Rashi says, Rashi says over here, um, Vayei Oser lo. It's, a, it's the left column, five lines from the top. Left column, five lines from the top. Vayei Oser lo. Says Rashi, lo vilo la. See that? Five lines from the top left column. Hashem responded to him. To him and not to her. Why? She'ein dome tefillah tzadik ben rasha. You can't compare the tefillah of a tzadik, the son of a rasha, le tefillah tzadik ben tzadik. Rivka was a tzadik, as who was her father? Besul, the rasha. Brother, love the brother. Yitzhak is a tzaddik. Who's his father? Avram Avinu. You can't compare her tefillah to his tefillah. L'thichach lo v'lo lo. Therefore, Hashem responds to him and not to her. What bothers you about that, Alex? Go ahead. Bring it. First of all, I'm a little confused. Go ahead. Um, were, were you saying about, like, your father's a tzaddik? So... I, 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 Rashi says like this. Yeah, yeah. The Torah says they were both davening, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the Torah says, Hashem responded to Yitzhak. Right. So Rashi points out, well, he responded to Yitzhak and not to Rivka. That's right. why the Torah, why? Because you can't compare the, tzad, the prayer of a tzaddik like Rivka, who's the daughter of a Russia. Her prayer is not the same potency okay. as Yitzhak, okay. who's the son of Avram Avinu. He's a tzaddik, the son of a tzaddik. One second, one second. Her father's a Russia. His father's a tzaddik. What's a Russian? Uh, an evil person. Oh, okay. But she's a tzaddik. She's a tzaddik. So the Torah says, yeah, well, you can't compare hers to his because his father was a tzaddik also. What's your reaction? Go ahead, say it. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, coming from an evil place, a tzaddik seems even more... Oh, perfect. Very, very good. Very good. Very good. It's like, the, you know, and that's not fair. I mean, look at what she did. Look what he did. Look what she did and look what he did. Right? What's the answer? You're praying on the merits of your father? So certainly there's that element. There's certainly that element. In other words, we're not talking about fair or not fair. We're talking about there's, a, there's an inherent over here. What can I tell you now? I want to make the basketball team, and, 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 and uh, uh, Marcus, Marcus Jordan also wants to make the basketball team. Right? right? Oh, I'm trying harder, as hard as him or even harder. There's only some, there, there, there's just something, uh, there's only one factor here. There are certain genes, right? There's certain genes. My five foot six inch father did not bequeath upon me the same basketball genes as Marcus Jordan's six foot six inch father bequeathed upon him. So there's just an inherent reality over it. In the spiritual realm, it's the same thing. There's, you said, your father was that, okay? That's one element. That's not the one we want. That's not the one we want. To, that doesn't answer your question. No. Your question is, hey, but it's not fair. Okay, so I want to tell you this. Remember, I, I once gave you this example. You walk into a shul, right? Two men are davening. Remember the example? And I tell you, two men are davening. One of them is davening like this. That's how you die. It's like you guys having like this. Yeah, okay, okay. Then I tell you, one of them is a Balchuva and one's an FFB, and you have to guess which one. Mm. Right, which one? Which one would you say, Gil? <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah. It's a no-brainer, right. right? Why is that? Why is that? There's a certain excitement that the Baal Tshuva has which gives him an advantage. For an FFB to daven like that Baal Tshuva, 
it doesn't mean all FFBs daven like that. If given a choice, one's an FFB, one's a Baal Tshuva, it's a no-brainer. But if you see two people davening like that, they're both davening, and I don't say that you should be doing this during that, you know, I don't say you should be giving <laughs> baseball signals during, during, during <laughs> davening. But if two people are davening with tremendous enthusiasm, who had to work harder to get to that level of enthusiasm? In many cases, the, Bef the, the FFB. The Baal Tshuva goes from zero to 60 by, by, de by, by nature of his choice. If I'm going to be a Baal Tshuva, I didn't join up. I gave up a career. I didn't give up a career to cancel around. If I gave up a career and I cut off my family and made a life change and made, went through difficulty, I didn't do it so that I could be texting during the avenue. And FFB, I've been in there from day school. I've been, I've, been, I've been texting since I was in second grade when my Rebbe also texted during Davening. You know, I mean, you know, what do you want from me? So the Rebbe, about the FFB has to pull, he has to reach back. It takes more for the FFB than it takes for the Baal Shiva. If Yitzhak and Rivka are Davening with potency, yes, she comes from that sort of background. But anyone from that back, you know, in Russia, in Russia, there were Russian Jews that go into hidden cellars and daven and make minions, right? Under the noses of the communists. And if you got found, if you got caught, you went to the KGB or you went to Siberia, right? How much talking do you think there was during davening in those shoals? How much, how much discussion during Chazor Sashas was there about sports and politics, right? Zilch. You know why? Because if I'm going to go, I'm not going to Siberia for the stock market. <laughs> I go to Siberia for religious principles. In other words, you almost get a, it's almost a, 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 a bizarre, it's a bizarre, it's almost a, 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 a strange advantage you have by being disadvantaged. You have a strange advantage being disadvantaged. Oh, Yitzchak, you're davening. Then you can't compare to prayer. Then you can't compare to prayers. Because if you're both davening with that, it means that the Yitzchak raised by Avraham Avinu, he had to reach back further than Arifka did, who's got a natural propel, something propelling her naturally because of her background. Odd, odd as it may seem. There's a third explanation, by the way. Third explanation is that, remember we mentioned Tzadik ben Tzadik sometimes refers to your previous incarnation. You're a Tzadik, the son of a Tzadik could be, that means you were a Tzadik in your previous incarnation, and in this incarnation you're a Tzadik as well where you have another person who was a Russia in his previous incarnation, and he was a tzaddik, he worked hard and made himself a tzaddik here, but it's not the same, it's not the same thing. But that is, that's something that you find like, do you know that the Rosh Hashiva of the Mir Yeshiva of Dustin Svi Finkel's itself? You know, he had, he had advanced Parkinson's, you know that? He built up the Mir Yeshiva at the 7,000, when he came to Mir, there were about, there were about, you know, 600, 700 students, he built the Mir up into the empire it is. He had Parkinson's, he used to travel the world with Parkinson's fundraising. He once went to a wealthy man, and, and for, with his, I, I saw him, I went to a shear of his, it was, it was unbelievable, watch him. He would walk into the shear, when he sat down in his home, he gave a chumashir on Fridays, he would sit down, and he would immediately cross his hands over and grab either side of the chair, the big chair, because he was shaking. And so he held the thing, and sometimes it was shaking so much his yarmulke would fall off. And the guy had to follow him back and forth with a microphone, as, as, he, as he was shaking. It was, it was a very, very disconcerting when I saw him. He raised a tremendous amount of money. He once went to a wealthy man, and he said to the wealthy man, we need a certain amount of money for the Mary Shiva. We have a project. The wealthy man said, oh, it's, it's very hard for me. And Rav Dostensky just looked at him while he shaking. He said, it's, it's hard for me, too. Right, you know, you, you, can, you, know, you, you know, you know, you could, you know, yeah, you know, you know, he played that card. He played the card, but he was that card. See, his disadvantage gave him a tremendous advantage. His disadvantage gave him an advantage because uh, you're not going to say no. They got Parkinson's and mixing up to your office in Manhattan, who had to who had to be taken by three people on a plane to get to you to ask you for money. You understand? So, so it, when it comes to davening, your background, that could also be a factor. That's what the, that's what the Farshim are saying. Yeah, a little better, Alex? Yeah, yeah it's something okay. to consider. Yeah, that, that gives you at least a, a, a logical angle. But the other is a factor also as far as the spiritual genetics. That's not the answer we want to hear. Because then we walk away saying, well, that's not fair. Well, my father wasn't Sadiq, his father wasn't Sadiq. So that's not fair. Give me a, give me an, a and, well, you have an advantage. You have the advantage over him. Here you, you think he's got the advantage. His father was a Sadiq. You've got the advantage because you came from a more difficult background. Therefore, your tefillah is more, is more potent. Oh, that I can understand. That I can understand. Okay. So uh, Rivka gets pregnant. Rivka gets pregnant, and then the next passage is going to go into Yaakov. Oh, we'll leave Yaakov and Esau for tomorrow. 
Okay, the, the birth of Yaakov Nesav. Okay. Yeah.